Hello, welcome to another video of Don't Panic Geocacher, a channel devoted to teaching you more about mystery caches and hopefully help you solve some of the mystery caches along the way. My name is Arjen and I go by waterfan 5 on the geocaching.com website. Recently I've gotten some feedback on some of the videos, um, especially related when I talk about ciphers and that people wanted to know more about the ciphers that I review. So that's what this video is going to be about. It's called Classic Ciphers Explained, because most of the ciphers that I talk about and that are used in geocaching puzzles are so-called classic ciphers. They used to be secure ciphers uh, in the olden days, but these days they're very hackable, crackable ciphers, which makes them ideal for geocaching puzzles. So today's um, video is not so much about solving a puzzle, but more about getting the background about the ciphers still may help you into analyzing a puzzle and solving a puzzle uh, going forward, but I won't be using any puzzles this time to explain other than some cipher examples. So classic ciphers explained, I kind of uh, classified them into three categories and I will discuss nine different common ciphers that I used. So monoalphabetic ciphers, uh, those are ciphers that do very straight transitions of letters. So every letter consistently matches to another letter. And I'll give three examples, Caesar, Ad Bash, and Substitution. Then I'll talk about transposition ciphers. Those are ciphers that change the way the letters are ordered, but not necessarily change the letters themselves. And then polyalphabetic, slightly more complicated, where each letter can actually map to another letter depending on their position in the cipher. So examples of those are Virginia, Playfair, and Foursquare. So nine different ciphers. For each of them, I will give a little bit of a background and we'll talk more about how they uh, modify a text and how they then encode themselves. So let's start with monoalphabetic ciphers. Caesar cipher, sometimes also referred to as a shift or rotation cipher, is exactly uh, what you think it is. It's a reference to Julius Caesar and that's roughly the time frame when this cipher was being used. It is a very straightforward cipher in that each letter is shifted by the same amount of positions in the alphabet. So if you have defined a certain alphabet, so if you take the most common alphabet with 26 letters, then every letter is shifted by a certain amount of positions. So that means that if you have 26 letters, you can shift between 1 and 25 letters. Note that as you really can shift in both directions, so left and right, it really ends up being that you can only shift 13 because then you're basically shifting in another direction again. So sometimes you see some uh, websites only referring to 13 with the direction of left and right. So you can see why this also is called a shift or a rotation cipher as it kind of shifts and rotates in the alphabet. It also means that at the end of the alphabet, you start again at the beginning. So for example, the letter Z shifted one would become the first letter in the alphabet by the A again. So let's take a look at an example. So I'm uh, doing a shift rotation of two. And so here uh, in the rotation of two means that every A would become a C, every B would become a D, every C would become an E. So you see everyone is basically shifted forward. And it's kind of like rotating, if you think about a circle, that it's rotated two on a circle, so everything. So that also means that if you look at a text, this is exactly how you would translate the text. So if this is, this is an encrypted uh, text, if that is the plain text that you want to encode, first look at the top row, which where is the T, and now the encrypted one is the letter V. The same one if I go to the H, so here you see the H, then in the bottom row it is the J. Now, this is a clear example of uh, a monoalphabetic uh, cipher because each time we encounter the letter I, for example, it is encoded to the same letter. So I says K, and we see that here I matches K, but the next I also matches to K. And the same for any other letter that is repeated. The T, you see here, in both cases it matches to the V, the same as in the beginning. This, of course, will give a very cryptic text, but it's very straightforward to code. There's only 26 different options. 
options, right? Or 25 different options, because those are the amount of mutations in the alphabet. So you see many websites that just show you all the different rotations and see if one of them matches. So this is a clear example of uh, a cipher. Now decoding it, of course, basically means that you have to do the operation in reverse. So if we have a V, you look in this case at the bottom row, where is the V? And then in the top row, you now see the T, and that is the plain text variant. And the same going forward, you do the J, get the next, and it's the H, and so on. So this is, of course, specific for rotation two. If I rotate a three, then this one would be slightly different. Now an A would map to the letter D, the B would map to E, basically shift forward, and so on, right? So every one of the rotations are slightly different. Uh, the geocaching.com website, of course, this is the rotation 13. So basically it's halfway into the alphabet, but again, a very basic rotation. Now, a variant of that is AdBash. Uh, AdBash could be used in combination with Shift, but typically when people refer to the AdBash cipher, um, it means um, no Shift is involved, but potentially it could be an AdBash with a Shift. I've seen that sometimes being used as well. The variant of AdBash with compared to Caesar is that it reverses the alphabet. So here you see A goes to Z, B goes to Y, C goes to X. So basically this is just the uh, reversal in the alphabet. And so slightly more tricky because it's not like everything is shifted by the same amount. They're actually all shifted by a different amount. So the N and M, but the M is here shifted one, while the N of course is shifted technically 25 or minus one in the opposite direction and so on, right? So L is shifted three, the O is shifted minus three. Again, 23 in this case. But the way you encode it and the way you decode it is very similar. You look at it at the top, T, you see which matter, a letter it matches to, G, and that will now become your encrypted text. Same for all the other letters, H, Yes, see that is the encrypted letter, and so on. Decrypting, we do it in reverse, right? So we go to the G and we look up, then it matches to the T, that will be my native letter. And the same with any other letter, so for example, X matches to the C, so the C matches to the X. Same encrypting, decrypting, it's basically just a reverse operation. So that's the add bash cipher, it just reverses the alphabet. If it would shift, you basically just think about shifting this one by one. So the A would now point to Z, B would now point to X, and of course, forward, the A would actually point to itself in this case. And that's why add bash typically is not shifted because you would get letters that start mapping to themselves, which you typically try to avoid in the cipher. So that's an add bash example, it's just reversing the alphabet. Now, if you can reverse the alphabet, there's of course many other ways that you can create an alphabet. And this is what typically is called the substitution uh, cipher. Substitution cipher means that each letter is replaced with a specific other letter, but there is not a specific order defined in which these letters are. So you saw earlier with the Caesar that was always shifted in the alphabet. So once you knew that one was shifted, all the other ones were shifted in the same way, right? However, you can completely scramble the alphabet and just say an A goes to the next random letter and the B goes to another next random letter. As long as all of them map uniquely to one letter, so each letter maps uniquely to another uh, unique letter, you have a substitution cipher. So you have to make a certain, what is called a cipher alphabet and say, what is each letter mapped to? Now there's typically tools that can help you with that and then it becomes more, and they work with, for example, that you provide a keyword that you say, I'm using a keyword. I put that at the beginning of my alphabet and then uh, the rest, I just follow the regular alphabet. Order. Now it's called keyword substitution cipher. And I will give an example of a random, as random alphabet and a keyword substitution alphabet and how they are made. And of course, how they then encode So here I use a stain plane forward substitution. So I mapped each letter to another letter in the alphabet. So A here matches to Q, B to W, C to E, 
If you look closely, then you can see what I've done here. I've actually used the layout of the keyboard to make my alphabet. But I kept the rules of the subscription cipher, meaning that each letter maps to one letter, right? The letter Q is only used once here. And each letter in the alphabet is has a corresponding letter. So you see no letters are duplicated here. And now we can just encrypt the text again. So T start the same to Z, H maps to I, and I is just to O. So we see that we encrypt the text. And the same way for encoding is when we do the reverse, we look at the letter Z we see this maps to a T, etc. This one, of course, is harder to communicate because in the other ones, we just had to say, oh, use the alphabet in reverse of the app bash cipher or shift all letters by three. And we have a Caesar shift cipher. In this case, we need to communicate the entire alphabet. And so I have to specify to people, this is the exact 26 letters map these to the alphabet. So there's more to communicate. Right, so I have to communicate the whole thing. Well, to kind of avoid that, so-called keyword substitution was created. And keyword substitution is where you only communicate one sentence or one word. So here, my keyword that I used here is don't panic geocacher. And kind of what you do is you put that at the beginning of your alphabet. You see that right here, don't. But you see that I didn't use all the letters. Now, why didn't I use all the letters? Well, there was a rule with substitution ciphers that each one can only be mapped individually to one. So if I have a duplicate letter that I've already used, I can't use it again and I have to skip it. So you see here D, O, N, T, P, A, all unique letters. But the N I had already used before. So I have to skip the N, I can't use it twice. And the same going forward, I and C were unique. G and E were unique, but the O was already used before in don't, so I have to skip that one and so on till I've done all the letters. Once I've done that, I can now just start with the alphabet. And so you see here, the first letter in the alphabet I hadn't used was the B. So that's where the B comes from. C, D, and E were already used, so I have to skip those. The next one is F and so on till I have, of course, done the entire alphabet. So I've kind of scrambled the alphabet, but you can see what happens here at the end. At the end, all the letters start mapping to themselves. That can, of course, be very disastrous for your encryption. If you're using a lot of the end of the alphabet, you basically have plain text again. So keyword substitutions can actually be worse than a regular substitution because it may leave a lot of the text here encoded. So you see here six of the letters in the alphabet are encoded. Uh, not encoded. And you can see that in the translation because this is the text, the plain text. And in my encryption, you see that the letter Y actually maps to itself, the same as letter X maps to itself. So keyword substitution are certainly less uh, secure, but uh, they have the advantage I can just give somebody a keyword and they can make up the alphabet. So a good keyword substitution would preferably use letters late in the alphabet. That means that almost all the letters are in Q. So it's a good idea to put a Z or a Y in your alphabet to make sure you get the maximum encryption. Still very weak encryption, but better than nothing, right? For your puzzle, it might make it too easy if uh, you don't do that. But the way that the puzzle works is the same. So the T, you look at the table, matches to the S. The H matches to the C, and so on. And of course, reverse is the same way as we did before. Look up the S, this is the T. And you look, for example, up um, here, the X to itself. And for example, the T here, you want to decode it. We have to look up the T, here it is. And it encodes to the D. So you see that right here. So this is a keyword substitution explained. So that's all variations of substitution ciphers where each one kind of like encodes to um, a specific other letter. So this is different from some of the other ciphers. And that's the next set of ciphers that I'm going to explain, the so-called transposition ciphers. These ciphers don't 
change the letters themselves. They just change where they're placed in the sentence. So the three transposition ciphers I will cover are route transposition cipher, hill fence transposition cipher, and then the polymer transposition cipher. So again, we started with easier, a little bit more complicated. And so these ciphers, as I mentioned, all just switch letters. They don't necessarily change any letters. So we'll start with the route transposition. Um, sometimes also called path cipher. Um, and all has to do with writing and reading or writing a path in a text. Now, to do that, it changes the text into a matrix, so like a rows and columns. So if it's a text of 30 characters, then five rows of six, for example. And then it starts shuffling them around. And the way that it shuffles is by creating a so yeah, path or a route through that. And for that, you need to do two things. So other than just determining how many rows do you want, you also need to determine what is the reading and writing route. More or less can be translated is which uh, corner do you start? So do you start top left, bottom left, top right, bottom right? And which direction am I going, vertical or horizontal? And that gives you all the different combinations. So you see, for example, the decode website supports all these different combinations. And once you do that, you determine that for both how you want to read and how you want to write the information. So let's show that with an example. So here um, we've used the width of seven, and then we have uh, five rows in this case. And uh, the text, hello, this is a route cipher text. And we're going to read just normal writing text uh, horizontal and starting at the top left, but we're going to read from the bottom right and then upwards. Note that this is a direction is kind of like snake-like reading. So you see here, hello, this, but then the I is directly below the H and then so on. And then the O and you go down and then so on. So it's a little bit of a snake pathing mechanism. And so that's when the original text is. And then reading it, as I mentioned, we're going to start at the bottom right and then go up. So we'll start here at the X, go up to the H, jump over to the T, go back down, and so on. And this is how you then get the cipher text that you see right here. And of course, decoding it is exactly the same. You just change in the read and the write operation. So we write the text in here and now read it out like normally. And so that's a route transposition cipher, a very simple way to change the letters. But as you can see, it creates a surprisingly difficult text to read. Now, how you can distinguish a transposition cipher from what we just saw, the substitution ciphers, is that the letters are still there in the same frequency as you would expect for the normal language. So in English, you have a lot of E's. So we still see all the E's still here because we didn't change any letters. Where the substitution cipher changes the letters in the alphabet, this one just changes position. So you still expect the letters to be there in the frequency. And so when you look at the text, that's kind of a hint of what you're using. And that is the type of things that cipher identifiers look for when identifying what cipher has been. Okay, so slightly more complicated variant is the real fence cipher. Uh, it's more complicated because of the way that it's organized but it has less options. It really only determines how many rows you want, uh, where frequently often three is chosen, and which direction you want to read the text, and then it zigzags the text through the rails. So here you see an example of that. So we use three, but of course it could be any number. We're starting here at the bottom, and then we're using the offset five, which then brings us right in the middle, going upwards. And so that's when we start writing the text. As you see here in a zigzag pattern, that is the text, hello, this is a real fence cipher encoded text. And we just read row by row, rail by rail out the cipher text. And again, encoding is exactly the same. You just write out the encoded text, rail by rail, and now you read the zigzag pattern out there. So this is a, a 
popular cipher to be used for um, yeah, puzzles that you often see. And you see, may see hints like rail or something or train in there. And that might be kind of a hint that you look at the build cipher. Okay, um, more of an official cipher, but again, of course, still not secure. But in classic days, it was a polymer transposition cipher. This one is uh, unique in a way that it uses a keyword, and that keyword is used twice once to determine an amount of columns, and once to determine um, how the columns will be reordered. So it uses that same keyword twice, which makes it easy. You only have to communicate one keyword. And then after that, as long as you have an agreement how the text is read and write, similar like the cloud transposition, columns or by rows, how to read it, then you kind of can communicate and have an encrypted text. But just like the other ones, it just changes the uh, where the characters are placed in the text. It doesn't change any of the characters themselves. So here you see it being used. Use don't panic. And uh, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to uh, use the text hello. This is a polymer transposition cipher encoded text, like you see here. And that will then encode to this. Now, how does it do that? Well, as I mentioned, it uses the keyword twice. Once to determine the amount of, uh, in this case, columns. So you see here, don't panic at the top. And the text is just written underneath, right? That's the direction. That so this is a column position encoded cipher text, as you see here, just placed right there. But now there is an in-between step that happened, and that is kind of it's going to sort the um, the columns based on the text. So you see here, don't panic, and so D O N T T A N I C. So it uses a specific way of sorting. So that um, the columns are basically kept the same. So, for example, you see here N is used twice. The agreement is then that the first N will stay in front of the second N. That is important. Otherwise, we will need to um, use double letters. So this one allows you to use double letters. But um, yeah, it then just sorts it, as I just mentioned. So A C D I N N O B T, and now it reads it out again in the agreed direction by column. So you see here the column text right here that is placed. Now to decode, what do you have to do? You start with the keyword, you put the keyword in the alphabetic, so like this, you write in the text as you have it. So by uh, column by column, and you see that right here, and now you decode it. Since you have, um, you know that the C is the last one, you know that you have to skip one here because extra fill characters are not needed. So you just leave this one open since it's the last one of uh, text. So if there's any letters missing, they would be missing in the C column, right? Because it's the last one. And once you do that, you have to kind of unshuffle it again. So you have to uh, create the word don't panic again. So you take the column with the D and you place that at the first row. Then you take the column with the O and take put it at the second row. Then you take the column with the N, so it's the I M C E column, and place it at the third. And now you get the original text again, and you can read the text as it is here. And so that is how the columnar transposition cipher. Pretty fun cipher, and surprisingly with long keywords, uh, not that easy to decode if you have a shorter text. So geocaching with pages and code coordinates. This becomes surprisingly difficult to code, and you see, you see tools sometimes having problems with it since there are so many valid options. So those are some examples of transposition ciphers. So the next ciphers to discuss are so-called polyalphabetic uh, ciphers. Uh, I will discuss three: Pigeonier, Playfair, and Foursquare. Uh, these are three popular ones that you may encounter in geocaching puzzles. All of them have the characteristic that there is not a unique encoding of the letter that is in the source code, in the plain text, how it's being translated. So unlike monoalphabetic, where a letter is always translated to the same 
different ladder. These ones are dependent on their position within the source text, how they're translated, making them harder to decode. Again, these are still classic ciphers, but these were more used like a few hundred years ago, up till even like the beginning of the last century. These were still some ciphers that were at that point still considered secure. Nowadays, of course, they can be very easily hacked by other computers, and hence they used in uh, hobbies like geocaching, as kind of like amateurs allowing you to decode them. Let's take a look at the first one. A Vigineer. Vigineer is under many different <laughs> names known. Um, there's also many slight variants to it. Um, sometimes it's called one-time pad. This is more if the cipher uh, is encoded with a very long word that never repeats. It becomes kind of like a one-time thing. As long as nobody knows what that other text is, it becomes pretty hard to keep. It also is a keyed Caesar because every letter will be shifted with a different uh, number, so with a key number. Um, Beaufort and uncrackable cipher are two. Uncrackable because it was considered to be uncrackable. Depending on the cipher that you use, it's actually very crackable. <laughs> um, meaning that if you use a plain text keyword, it is pretty hard to decode in most cases, especially with text. If you use a very long keyword to encode, and it is not a plain English, like not a word, a couple of words, it becomes much trickier, and you get close to the crackable idea. So how does it work? Well, you take a keyword, and you shift it based on the letter in that keyword. First letter gets shifted with whatever the first letter is, second letter with the second letter and so on till you reach the end of your keyword and then you start all over again since the shift in the english alphabet only is from 0 to 25 so from 25 to 26 letters in the alphabet we also start with these numbers note that in this case the a represents not like a one but a zero no shift um, the D, the fourth letter in the alphabet, is then a shift 3, and the Z, the last letter, is then a shift 25. So that's why you can see why it's called Heat Cipher uh, Caesar, because it also it does a shifting, only it shifts each letter individually based on the key. This will become more clear with an example. So we have three things we have the plain text, we uh, have, of course, the keyword that we're going to use to encode the text and then the result of course is this cipher text that we get so here every letter is encoded to a different letter but not always to the same letter so unlike the monoalphabetic substitution ciphers that i talked about before where every letter always goes to the same here that is not the case and it depends on the position in the string so let's just take a look so t which is the 20th letter in the alphabet then G, which is then a 7, but as I mentioned, we have to subtract 1 because A is 0, so 6 in this case. So you get 20 plus 6, 26 letter in the alphabet, that would be a Z. And so hence, this is a Z. Same if the other way around, only now you subtract and you do the plus 1, do exactly the reverse. So to decode it, if you know the key, then you decode it. But the second letter, doesn't use the same shift, so it doesn't shift by 7. This one is only going to shift by 5, because that is the letter E. Uh, and of course we subtract 1, so now you get a shift 4. So you get 8 plus the 4 shift is 12, which is an L. And so on. Of course the ones that meet the letter A, they do no shift at all. So I stays an I. But since it has a random location, random every uh, every fifth in the category of eight, right? So there's eight characters, every fifth won't shift at all. But that's also kind of how they can be broken, right? So it's, the text is long enough, then at some point it will recognize like, hey, there is more than this number of characters in there. At the end of the alphabet, so for example, X and then H, you now see that it just starts at the beginning again. So it's translate again, and now it's shift back at the beginning. So that's kind of how a Vigineer cipher uh, works. Very popular to use 
pretty straightforward to calculate. And so you see lots of puzzles you need to decipher. And you see this keyword. You can also see that if this keyword was very long, the text may actually never repeat. So that's what you sometimes see, that if it's just a sentence, it can just use for every character a different um, rotation, a different rotation of the alphabet, making it for shorter text that is just as long as the plain text, pretty difficult to decode. So there is no way to analyze it if you don't know. So that's the Virginia cipher and how it works. So the Playfair cipher is a specific cipher that uses a five by five matrix that you fill with the letters of the alphabet. It's called the Playfair cipher. It's named after Lord Playfair. I think it was somewhere in the 1850s it was invented. And he invented the cipher. It has a fun name. So you may actually in geocaches, you may see hints that reference Playfair, right? So it says, oh, play fair when you solve this so Kind of give you a hint of what the cipher is. Since it only can use 25 letters, uh, we have to re get rid of one letter. And typically that means that we get rid of the letter J. So the letter J in the text is typically replaced in the keyword and in the text by the letter I. So that's something that we also have to do a special uh, rule that this cipher doesn't work if two letters are sequential letters are the same in uh, an odd and an even pair. Third and fourth are the same. That the cipher doesn't work. So we have to put axes in place to make sure that doesn't happen. And then we're going to use the matrix to decode. I will again show that an example. But the idea is that you look up the two positions in the matrix of the two letters that you want to encode, and then look for their row and column counterparts translation. So this one works in pairs. And so where the other substitution ciphers that we talked about before all looked at individual letters, these look at pairs of letters to translate. Also, of course, means that we need a even number to translate, and so extra access may be used in the text Make sure we get this even. There's another special condition, and I'll show that as well. If the letters are on the same line, we have to do something extra because there is no row column counterparts in that case because they're on the same row in that case. So in that case, we just shift one to the right. As well. So lots of extra rules, so slightly more complicated to do by hand, but certainly possible. So we'll go look at an example. So again, we have the text. This is a Playfair cipher encoded text. And we use in this case a password or the keyword that is don't panic geocacher. And similar like we've seen with other ciphers, since we have a unique alphabet, we can't repeat letters. You see here don't pen. The N was already used, so we skip that. Ik, G, O was already used, so we skip that. And so on. Till we get to the R. And then we start filling it in with the letters that we still have remaining. Note, as mentioned, uh, we don't lose the J, so any J would have become an I. So placing that in the plain text as well as in the keyword, that letter would be. It's kind of optional which letter you don't use, but that's kind of like the consensus. I've seen puzzles where other letters are not used, but it's rare. In most cases, it's the, the I and the J that are being duplicated. And then we're going to look at pairs of letters. So we're starting with TH. So TH, we see the T here, and we see the H in this location, and we're going to use the counterparts. So the T is called the position of the H, and that becomes the letter D, and the H is going to be the position of the T, and that will become the letter F. So you see here, TH becomes EF. And then we take the next two letters, IS. I is here, and S is here. And we do exactly the same thing. We look at their counterparts. The I is going to move over where the S is, become a G, and the S is going to move over where the I was, over here, M. So we get GM. So it always makes this little square, right? So we have IS, and we move to the row columns, and it becomes GM. This immediately also shows the weakness of the cipher because in English and in many other languages, letter combinations are quite unique. Not every combination 
it's possible. So you won't see a Q and an X frequently next to each other. And so this one can look at pairs and kind of see which pair of letters are most common. And that is most likely a common in the English language. For example, IS in English is pretty common. You see this is, we see it twice. And you see that they get encoded to directly the same letter combination, EM, DM. So even though I R that doesn't have a G or an a pair of letters in the same location, so starting at the even combination will always be encoded to the same text. In this case, GM for IS. So that's again a weakness of this and how an analysis tool, especially with longer text, can kind of crack the cipher and figure out what is the key. So um, we can do the entire text. Now I mentioned there was one special case, and that was the if the letters are the same way. So for example, in encoded, the O and the D are in the same. And we see they're right next to each other. And what the cipher simply does is just shift over. So the O becomes an N, the D becomes an N. So O, D becomes an N. So that's a special case. So lots of special cases to be done with Playfair. Um, but yeah, that is how you would Coded. And of course, going back, you do exactly the opposite, right? So you still create this matrix just with your keyword, but now you look at D and F and you kind of go, instead of going, the D now goes to T, the F goes to H. So you do the exact same operation again, where you make that little square, D, T, uh, H, F, D and F becomes T and H and so on. So also here, NO, it would detect it's on the same, but instead of shifting to the right, it would switch to the left. And so now it moves to D. That's how the Playfair cipher works. So Playfair cipher, less than 200 years old, um, 170 years, I guess, by the time of this release of this video. So um, pretty interesting cipher but certainly has its flaws we have to put the extra axis so that makes the text also longer and more vulnerable so that's where other variants were created as well two square and four square and as the name says they simply use two squares and four squares but they kind of use the same principle let's take a look at that so four square instead of using one square uses four of these matrices which also allows us to use two keywords because if we have four, we have to do two translations. And so this one often works with two different keywords or two different cipher alphabets generated based on the keywords. Similarly, it was like we saw with Playfair, similar like we saw with some of the other alphabets that we needed. Similar, because we're using still a five by five, we have to get rid of one letter. So we do that with the J it's being replaced by an I. And after that, we can now look in the matrices, but now we look each letter in its individual matrix and look up the other one. This will become more clear once we do an example. Again, here also we need an even number because it encodes in pairs of letters. So that is important. So here we see an example. So we have here our plain text. This is the cipher text that we are going to create. So and this is our don't panic and geocacher are our two keywords. So we have two keywords here. And here is how it works. The first one is just in plain alphabetical order, A, B, C, D, E, Z. The last one as well, A, B, C, D, E, Z. But the other ones both have a keyed cipher, similar like Playfair, where the passwords are put in place. Panic and geocacher. And again, you see duplicate letters are removed. So here the N in panic is not there because we already have an N. The same with here, Kesher, the C and the E are not there because they're already been. And now we kind of do the same as we did with Playfair. We look up the location of the letters and then we look for the counterpart the letters in the series. So if we look for the T and the H, so we look at the T here and the H here. So we see the T go over to where the H is and we get the letter R and the same for the 
H, we look up where the T is. T is here, right? So we get at the letter D. So this is how it works. So we're using the position in the matrices one and four for the T and the H to get to the positions in the other two, which is in the second and the third one, and we get the R and the D. So same for the next one, uh, I and the S. So I is here, S is here, and we see where they kind of like intersect. And so that we get the C here, and then the other one, uh, T, right? So where the I and the S, S is here, I is here. This is where they inter the other intersection. So again, it works in pairs of letters and creates a full cipher text. But in this case, we never have to worry about them being in the same row or the same column because everything in the other matrix always has a counterpart. So that's how the four square cipher works. So you need two keywords. Of course, you could use the same keyword in both, make it less secure. But um, with two keywords, you have to create these four matrices and you can work with it. No longer have to work about being on the same row, extra access to be put in place. We don't have the restriction that it can't encode if it is the same letter. We don't have that problem. So definitely advantage of Playfair, but yeah, we need to agree on the on keywords. That's the end of this video. I hope you learned something about ciphers and how they work, what they are, it's a little bit about their background. Um, hope you enjoyed it. If you like this video, please press like. If you'd like to stay up to date, um, most of the videos are discussing geocaching solutions. This was more of a background on ciphers, a slightly different video. But please press subscribe, that way you will get notified uh, when new videos come out and it will also pop up on your YouTube feedback. If you have any comments, please leave a note. More than happy to uh, receive feedback on what is happening here. And as you see, this was based on um, your feedback. This video was created. So thank you very much for that. If you have any other questions or suggestions, um, you want to contact me as waterfan5 on the geocaching.com website, or you can email me at geocacher.waterfan5 at gmail.com. With that, hopefully this will help you solve uh, some puzzles. Hopefully this will give you some more knowledge so that you don't have to panic the next time you see a geo.